Welcome to the Chase Podcast. Dr. Ron Charles is a renowned archaeologist, author, historian, speaker, missionary, and is known as the Christian Indiana Jones. Dr. Charles has spent over 50 years researching and uncovering truths about Jesus Christ and information that proves the historical authenticity of the Bible. Gleaned from his years of tireless research, ministry, and archaeological work as the pages of the Bible come to life like never before. Visit cubitfoundation.org for Dr. Ron's books and information about this global ministry. Moses went down this swell with the elders, and the elders stayed in this area, and Moses went up to the rock where God was standing. And then the miracle took place. Moses struck the rock, and uh, I was looking at him in my Bible because I have it written down. The, according to the Egyptian records, the water went up in a geyser um, six doffs high. And a doff is, a, is an ancient Egyptian uh, method of measurement, you know, kind of like feet and inches. And one doff is equal to five feet. So six doffs meant that the water squirted up 30 feet in the air. And it continued to do so for many time, for for a long time, to the point that this entire area filled up with water, and it filled up to uh, not only to the level of uh, of the ground, but actually went up into uh, the sides of the hills and the mountains that went all the way around, and it was one of the largest reservoirs of fresh water of the ancient world in that region and the water was pure and it was cold and very nice and it was certainly enough to feed or to service uh, four million or 12 million it didn't matter there was enough water for everything and everybody and it the Word got out about this great miracle, and the Amalekites, who were over in Saudi Arabia, uh, they said, we, we, the, we want that water. And so they came to try to confiscate it, and that's when Joshua defeated him in battle at the same place. And then uh, Moses was with Ur and Aaron on, uh, on the mountain, looking down on the battle that was taking place in the, um, in the, the oasis itself, and Joshua defeated them. But it was enough water to not only for them to meet their needs, and they stayed there in that area for uh, about nine months, and uh, it met all their needs plus anything that they would want to carry with them uh, in storage. And um, it remained uh, such. The, I don't know if the geyser went that high forever, but it continue to supply water uh, not only for the lake that it that it caused but also it rejuvenated the river that was uh, that was originally going through there and made that water uh, brand new no more sulfur no more salt and uh, that's why that that Riffium oasis today is one of the uh, one of the most pleasant in all the Sinai desert and, uh, and like I said, Paul and I stayed there. We spent the night a couple of nights there. It's beautiful, beautiful there. And it's because of this refreshing. And it continued to uh, flow. The water continued to um, make a difference in that region up until the Islamic invasion of the year 640 A.D. And so this originally took place at approximately 1534 B.C. And then in 640 A.D., right on the beginning of the Islamic uh, invasion of Egypt, in which, um, in which Egypt uh, then changed from Christian to Muslim, there was a great earthquake in this area. 
And when the earthquake took place, it uh, uh, sealed up the water. And um, eventually, you know, since that time, all of it has evaporated and so forth. And so you can still see um, where, the, where the lake was. You can still see the, um, what the water has done to the rock in, um, in carving out uh, places where the water was flowing and that type of thing. So it's quite inspirational. But uh, unfortunately, when the Islamic invasion took place, then for some reason, God shut off the water. And since then, that area that was so beautiful and lush is uh, all but dried up and nothing is left of any greenery except in the oasis itself, just in Ruffian. But what I want to point out to you is that uh, uh, the, the people, you know, they originally, they, they uh, initially blamed God, then they blamed Moses, and they blamed God again. And uh, the last sentence that we, that we read in verse number seven, is the Lord among us or is he not? Now, that place is still called Mesha, uh, Mesha stone or blue stone or blue rock now. But it, it's still the same, the same word, Mesha. In our own lives, how many times do we say, Lord, are you here or not? Are, are you in this? Are you directing us or not? Even though if we would just stop and think back, to all of the good things he's done in our life. All the times he's healed us, all the times he's worked out financial miracles on our behalf, all the time he's come to the rescue of our children, all the times that he's protected us through uh, absolute sure injury, but yet we escaped. When we're up against it, when there is no water, so to speak, no hope of getting beyond this point, we seem to forget about God's deliverance from our Red Seas and the deliverance from our enemies who are chasing us. And some of the first things we either say verbally or think in our head is, God, where are you? Are you still with me or not? Are you here or not? If, if you knew that this was going to take place and this was going to happen, why did you lead us here? God, it just don't make no sense. We have found ourselves over the last 30 years five years in missions work many times and we would say Lord <laughs> if you knew this was going to take place why didn't you get us out of here why didn't you move in such a way that we wouldn't have to go through all of this garbage if you really loved us then why are we starving to death, so to speak? Why do we have no refreshing? Why do we have no answer? Why do we have no direction? The only thing we see in all directions is torment of horror and dissatisfaction and no direction whatsoever. God, don't you care? Are you with us or not? And then in the midst of that, God never did talk to Moses and say, it's okay, my son. I'll, I'll work everything out for you. There's never an indication that Moses got a comforting hand from his brother Aaron or from Ur or from anyone else. Not a comfort from Miriam, his sister, from, from, from no one. 
and not even from God. God did not come to him and say, Moses, you've done a great job. You've led these millions of people. You've listened to me, and I'm proud of what you've done. In the very midst of it, Moses cried to the Lord, What do you want me to do? I've done everything for you. What more can I do? So in the midst of that, when he was perhaps fully expecting some type of comfort, fully expecting God to give him some type of direction just to, just to prevent from being killed by a stone. Then God spoke. And this is what he said. Take your leadership and go walk north. And go up to this rock that's up there. And I'll meet you up there. Real words of comfort, wasn't it? And what is going to a rock going to do to help quench the thirst of these people who are going to cut my head off? What, what kind of comfort is that? And what type of an assurance is God giving with this? Go to the rock. And then when you get to that rock, now this is the kicker. When you get to that rock, I want you to hit it with your stick. I would not make a good Moses. Because I might have just said, you've got to be kidding me. You mean, of all the things that you could tell me, to give me some assurance, you want me to go hit a rock with my rod. But Moses did it. And when he did, one of the greatest miracles ever recorded in the Word of God and in history took place. Because out of that rock, we don't know where the water came from. Obviously, it was underground someplace. But how it made it up through the rock, we don't know. And they never did find out. There were many, many, many attempts especially by the British, to find out how it happened. They never found out. In our lives, I'm sure that there have been times in your life, and maybe you're going through it right now. You feel, God, if you're in control, why did you bring me here? Why am I at this stage in my life? Why am I here not knowing where to go? Having problems with Congressman Omar, uh, personal uh, attacks. And we were discussing it, and, and Paula says this, Well, the Lord has been impressing upon me to pray for her. And I didn't question her. I don't ever question her about what God tells her to do. But, in, but, I, but to me, I said, Lord, I'm glad you didn't tell me to pray for her. Because <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't, wouldn't. And I would have just left my stick behind. <laughs> and uh, not hit that rock. Because it's just not logical. But... When you do what God says, then the rock splits. And life's water came up. And she feels that as she prays for her, her hard heart is going to be broken. 
and the life giving water of salvation is going to come into her life, which will be the greater miracle. And so, in your life, in your situation, God knows it, God understands it, God sympathizes with it, but don't be surprised if He asks you to do something that's totally illogical. But if you do it, it will work. Why did God choose to have His Son, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Savior of Humanity, to come from Nazareth, the garbage city of the region? I think that God wanted everyone to know that Jesus is the Savior, the God, the King of all, all the way from the worst of the worst to the highest of the high, from the person who was born with two strikes against him from the day of his birth up to those that were born in king's palaces. And as it was then, then actually so it is now. Those of you who may not be aware of it, Jesus still occupies the garbage cities today. And let me clarify that. Yes, he lives in the hearts of us all. But there are persecuted believers all over the world who do not live in beautiful houses like we do, who, not, who don't drive wonderful cars, who don't even have horses to ride, or don't even have a flat or even a blanket to cover with. Because these people, many of them, were not born into a Christian family like many of us are in the West. They were born into an Islamic family in an Islamic neighborhood, Islamic city, and an Islamic country. And when those people accept Jesus and choose to accept Jesus as their personal Savior, then in many countries, the old saying that Paul says that old things are passed away, behold, all things become new, becomes a literal fact to them, but in the negative sense, not the positive sense like Paul was talking about. Because the life that they once knew is forgotten, and a new life of horror, terror, and persecution begins. In the world today, there are 111 countries where persecution has taken place of believers. Right now in the world, every hour, 20 people die for the cause of Christ. Every hour, 24 hours a day. That does not include the ones who have to suffer through mistreatment. They had their eyes gouged out for reading the Word of God, having their tongues cut out for praising the name of Jesus, having their hands cut off for lifting them in praise to the Lord, not being able to get a job, not being able to get a house, no food, no good, clean water, no medical treatment. That doesn't include those which could go into the thousands. I'm talking about just the ones who suffer death. 20 people every hour die for the cause of Christ. And so many of these people, once they accept Jesus as their personal Savior, they find themselves living in the garbage dumps of the city throughout the world. We know that the Middle East is not the only ones that this happens. We've been ministering using Egypt as our springboard into Sudan, into Libya, into Algeria, into Somalia, into Syria, and throughout the Middle East. So those are the areas that we're more familiar with than any place else. But, but I know as a fact that we've seen them ourselves. We've seen the garbage cities in India. There are garbage cities that are there in Pakistan, garbage cities in other areas. And, Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan, 
We've heard about them in North Korea. We've heard about them in China. My son has come across them in South America who uh, heads up our South American ministries. He's ran across them in Mexico, Colombia, in Argentina, Venezuela, other places where people, the only living that they can make is there in the garbage. And many of them are there because of their stand for the acceptance of Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And in our situation, which we're most familiar with, we know that throughout the Middle East, that that, that is known is that there's 20, uh, there's 38 garbage facilities throughout the Middle East, Northern Africa, that are used as housing for believers who are former Muslim who accepted Jesus as their personal savior. And in those 38 garbage facilities, 27 million people live. Those 27 million people were once Muslims, once followers of Islamic religion, but they willingly made a decision to accept Jesus as their personal savior. And when they did, they had the opportunity to spend the rest of their life in the garbage dumps of those cities. There they drink the water of the slimy seepage that comes out of the piles of garbage, eat the filth out of the garbage for their food, and wear the rags that come out of the garbage for their clothing. And they make those decisions to accept Jesus irrespective of how their life is going to be from that time forward. Throughout America, every Sunday morning, and throughout Western Europe for that matter, every Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, there are multiplied thousands in our cities, thousands of born again believers, those that say that Jesus is my savior. I've accepted him into my life. He's the Lord of my life. Multiply thousands of these born again believers cannot give up their pillow and bed for Jesus. How can they give up their lives for him? And these people, have given up everything. And many times they have given him up, they've given up everything just hearing Jesus' name one time, just once. And so even today, in our present day society, throughout the world, our Jesus is still occupying the garbage city. For these people, those who have given up everything, for him, and he walks with them on a daily basis. He's their savior. And I'm totally convinced of this, that when we stand before our great God on that day that we receive those rewards, I'm quite certain, in fact, I'm absolutely positive, that my position is gonna be so far back that you won't even be able to see me because in front of me are going to be these multiplied thousands of no-name people who have given up everything to follow Jesus, and they are living for Him and have given up their whole life for Him. And He walks with them in this garbage city every day. They will be there collecting those rewards far sooner than myself or many of the rest of us. And so, does anything good come out of Nazareth? Absolutely the best of the best, the greatest of the great, at that time as well, is in our world today. Lord bless you. Welcome to Canaan, a small indigenous community 
here on the west coast of Colombia. In recent years, Canaan has grown tremendously. The people here have a heart for God and for sharing His love. This is where the Cubit Foundation does their work. Over the years, Cubit has worked on developing the community in many ways, and by doing so, they've developed personal relationships and bonds that will last a lifetime. Lo recibimos con mucho amor, recibimos con mucho aprecio, con mucho afecto, porque sabiendo que si esta persona vive tan lejos, no nos conoce y nos viene a visitar, eso para nosotros es muy satisfactorio y, y, y toca mi corazón de una manera especial. Brad Charles is one of the leaders behind Cubit and their work in Canaan, Colombia. His passion is for helping people in need around the world and doing God's work out here on the mission field. The Cubit Foundation has done some incredible work here thus far, and God's presence is truly evident. with local Colombian churches, Cubit has taken part in service to the village of Canaan. And with your help, Cubit will continue to serve them and many more around the world. When people give to Cubit, I want them to go. I want them to go with me. And I want them to experience this. Lo imposible para el hombre es posible para Dios. To find out more and to become a part of what Cubit is doing here in Colombia, log on to cubitfoundation.org. That's cubitfoundation.org. The Chase with Dr. Ron Charles is sponsored by supporters of the Cubit Foundation. Visit cubitfoundation.org for Dr. Ron's books and discover how you can support this global ministry.